good afternoon, or wherever you are in the world uh, who's joining us. Good morning, good evening. Uh, it's terrific to have you with us for this inaugural um, Tuck Board Chat, which is one of the innovations we've created listening to students and just thinking among ourselves about what kind of um, new learning opportunities our world presents us, both through technology, but also through uh, uh, to respond to and think about the coronavirus pandemic and how it's affecting our world. And, and these board chats are intended uh, just as context. I think many know, but I'll remind everyone, uh, we're very fortunate at Tuck School. We have five advisory boards and councils. Uh, we have a board of advisors. We have the MBA advisory council, the three leaders of which are with us here, Lila, Mike, and Eric, I'll introduce in a moment. And we have three global councils as well, one that focuses on EMEA, we had a morning call with them actually uh, 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 today, uh, one based on uh, focusing on Asia Pacific and one on the Americas. Um, and so the idea of these uh, board chats was to actually hear from some of our most uh, distinguished, successful, dedicated alumni, um, a learning opportunity from what you're seeing in the world, how your organizations are responding, how you personally are responding. Um, so in that spirit, we thought we would convene these board chats and we're very fortunate today, and I'll introduce uh, Leela Srinivasan, Mike Kester, and Eric Anderson. Um, Mike is the current chair of the MBA Advisory Council. Uh, he uh, finishes his term at the end of this academic year and move on to the Board of Advisors. Uh, Eric is the incoming chair of the council, and Leela is the uh, incoming vice chair and will succeed Eric. So there's kind of a triumvirate of uh, three of our alums. Uh, what they do in terms of life in addition to their family and things, Mike is currently, he's a T99. He's a partner and managing director at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Leela is a TO6, she's the Chief Marketing Officer at SurveyMonkey, and Eric at TO7, actually at Dartmouth 2000 also, is founder and CEO of Ulysses Diversified Holdings. Um, and um, I think what we'll do, do you guys actually do want to say a little bit, anything else about yourselves, and then we'll just start the conversation. I think the goal of the conversation is, um, I'll start it with a few kind of questions, and we'll go back and forth a little bit, and then through the Q&A or the chat, uh, anybody who's joined us here, uh, we're approaching 100, um, feel free to put your comments or questions to um, Leela or Mike or Eric as a group and we'll go until about one o'clock. Um, but I'll pause, Eric, Mike, Leela, anything you wanna say uh, to the predominantly students, but some faculty and staff as well? I'll just say okay. we're thrilled to be with you. This is, this is fun and different and exciting and we're, uh, at least for me, I don't wanna speak for, for Leela and Eric, but. Uh, but I'm excited to be here and to spend the next hour with you. Likewise, on my side, uh, the only add I'll have to Matt's uh, gracious introduction is uh, I'm also a mother of three. So um, uh, doubling as a, a part-time uh, homeschooling teacher right now. And do, Leela, are we going to have any, uh, are we going to have any future Tuckies of the, of the three? They're going to make a, a visit at some point during the call? <laughs> I, ho I hope they're future Tuckies. I genuinely, <laughs> genuinely hope we don't get a visit. <laughs> I would add, again, just to echo what Mike was saying, just truly honored uh, to be able to be part of this group uh, and the work that we do at the, at the advisory council and, and have that just be a connection that I'm able to benefit from being with Tuck. Um, I live here in Hanover and I have four young kids, although I'm at my office in Hanover right now. And so lest I forget before we get off, I am local. So normally people can drop by and it's a lot easier for me to see them here in town. And I'm always happy to do that in this you know, COVID world, uh, a Zoom call is equally accessible. So my office is just above Starbucks on Main Street. And anyone who wants to follow up or talk, I'm happy to, to, to chat here locally. Uh, got it. And, and thanks, Eric. And I'll just say, um, Leela Hale's originally from Scotland. I'm going to switch back to give us a little tuck flavor here. But for those who are wondering, this is about 10 miles in Scotland at the old course in St. Andrews from where she grew up. <laughs> so uh, let me start then. Thank you, guys. And um, uh, with, a, with an opening question, um, it's a broad one. Please take it in any direction you like, and maybe we'll go, uh, we'll go with Mike, our current board chair, to kick us off, and then maybe Leela and Eric. Um, uh, if I asked you what has been the biggest challenge to your organization from the coronavirus pandemic, uh, what would you describe it as? Mike, I'll start with you. Biggest challenge. Sure. So um, as Matt said, I, you know, I work for a large global investment bank. Um, and any time that there is, you know, financial disruption or economic dis disruption, um, things tend to go uh, haywire. Um, there becomes an urgency to just about everything. That urgency could be a company dealing with a liquidity crisis. Um, it could be the oil markets, um, you know, doing things that have never happened before, like West, Tex West, West Texas Intermediate uh, for May delivery um, going to negative 37. You know, who would have who thought? Um, so there's all manner of things that, that go haywire. Um, 
that we have to deal with, and we have to deal with that for our clients. And in my case, where I work in the uh, the direct investing business, we have many of our portfolio companies that that are dealing with these issues. So it always goes up full tilt right away, um, and you know there's an urgency to to everything. Um, and you get these phone calls at, on your cell phone at odd hours of the night, and you're like, okay, it's midnight and people need to respond before a market opening at 9.30. And there's you know, an enormous amount of analysis and thought that needs to go into it. Now that's an ordinary course when markets dislocate. So you obviously have a, a massive dislocation going on um, in the markets as well as um, you know, in the real economy. Uh, but what, to more specifically answer your question, Matt, what's hardest is obviously dealing with the, the personal element of all that. So dealing with all of that while um, you know, you're, you have a, a stable environment. So you're in the office or home is calm or, or what have you. So the overlay of the global health pandemic, um, you know, obviously has been, has been the most challenging part. So you're trying to be responsive uh, to people and employees and their personal issues. You're trying to be responsive to uh, clients, vendors and others dealing with their personal issues. And then you layer on top um, the you know the um, you know the craziness of, of what everyone's dealing with in their professional lives and so it's the balance of the two um, I would say because we're a global business we did see the rotation of where beginning in you know Beijing and uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai and our, our teams there and watching it roll around the world um, you know that has provided a lot of good learnings that um, you know have helped us deal with with um, the work from home opening up, which is starting to happen in certain of our offices, and I'm happy to come back to that later, but I think it's that overwhelming, um, it's a professional, um, it's chaos professionally, uh, overwhelmed by a, um, something that has touched everybody personally, uh, whether that's our, our team, our clients, um, and everybody we come into contact with. I think that's been the most, the most challenging part organizationally for, for us. Hmm. Thank you, okay, so I heard the, oh, the complex overlaying chaos of both professional and personal is the biggest organizational challenge. Thank you. Leela? Yeah, so uh, somewhat similar themes to some of what Mike shared, but I would, I would break this down um, perhaps into a three-part story. So I think about the first, let's call it the first half of March, um, and I should back up and say SurveyMonkey, for those of you who don't know, is a, a global organization. So we have uh, 1,300 employees in seven or eight different countries, including a small engineering office in Italy, where things really went went uh, downhill very quickly in early March. Um, so if I think about the first thing that we did as a company, um, it was leaping into um, a crisis communications mode. And I would, I would say this entire crisis has been a crash course in crisis comms for, for organizations everywhere. So we spun up an emergency response team in the, the first half of March. And we're really just trying to keep up with the constant flow of news and information around the globe so we could figure out how to keep our employees safe first and foremost, how to keep them healthy. So that first period was, was really all about just trying to, trying to figure out how we could manage our workforce and help them stay safe while still serving our customers, of course. Um, but we were on top of it, on top of it. And then I think it was uh, March 16th or so, uh, there was a, a, the shelter in place order came in California. We were, were headquartered and for a while, the wheels just were off the bus, I'd say for 48 hours while we scrambled to try and make sure we were staying on top of how, again, could we help employees adjust to a world where we were not saying that work from home was optional, but we were strongly encouraging it. And many jurisdictions where we operate were mandating it. Um, so that was, that was sort of part one. The second part, once everybody got to work from home, was figuring out how to help the team stay productive and prioritize. And I, I feel this deeply as a head of a marketing organization um, at an organization whose mission is to power the curious and who, you know, we help organizations turn feedback into action. Um, for every customer we have that is, you know, a business that's, that's going out of existence or furloughing employees, we have a, a you know, a, a government entity or an education establishment that's, that's switching to virtual distance learning or a hospital that is trying desperately to get in touch with its constituents. And so helping the team to figure out how do we how do we um, pivot our offerings to make sure we're supporting those who've never needed us more um, while still going about the day job and carrying on some other things that were in motion? And I found it was very important to have um, increasing prioritization discussions with members of my team who were simply overwhelmed with the things that they were being asked to do as a marketing organization. 
Um, and then you put that against the backdrop, as Mike said, of just people adjusting to a whole new world and figuring out how to homeschool while taking care of an elderly parent or figuring out if they can find flour in the store, right? I mean, people were just really struggling with the, with the amount of change they were facing personally. So um, helping to make sure that we were listening to employees constantly throughout that and adjusting our, our course as well. This third period, as we've kind of settled into this new normal, has been about, uh, I'd say as a leader, largely about trying to figure out how we can maintain morale and momentum. And so, uh, you know, continuing to check in with the, with the workforce, with our customers, just trying to make sure that we understand how the humans are navigating this whole process. Um, it's been, uh, you know, I think that the thing I'm, I'm proud of is the way the team has really rallied and stayed productive. And we've been able to, to do some incredible things as an organization for the community, for our customers, for one another. And so it's been a, a period that I think has been quite emotional for, for many of us, just seeing how we rally and the resiliency that's built into the organization and the customers that we serve. So started with crisis comms and a little bit of a falling off the bus, prioritizing, staying productive, and then moving to morale and maintenance. Wow, that's a great overview. Come back to a ton of things I'd like to mention later. Okay, thanks. And echoing Mike a bit on the, on the chaos. Eric, any opening thoughts on biggest challenge to your organization? My first opening thoughts is that was like really well organized, you two. I mean, that's like a class. I should have prepared more. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the hardest thing. So our at Ulysses Diversified Holdings, our family office, we're in the healthcare and entertainment space broadly defined. So I'll give you a story from both. So in the entertainment side, I'm the chairman of the board of Major League Rugby. And we were in the middle of a season, of a rugby season. And uh, we had to make a decision about what we would do for our players and for our staff and for our fans and everyone else, really in advance of when we had clarity from the federal or the state governments. And we operate in a number of different states. And so there was a, there was a hodgepodge of rules and guidance. And, and obviously, uh, infectious disease operates at a very local level. Um, I also am the co-founder of, of an infectious disease company many years ago. So it's, um, this is an area of expertise for us. And so we were luckily, lucky, I think, to have the right people around. Um, and we were able to move quickly to basically shut down the season uh, because of the timing of when we'd come back and some insights we had. We actually closed down our season. And in part, that decision was made um, based on the safety of our fans and the guidance there. But it was also, we have a lot of international players who just wanted to be home with their families. And it's very expensive for us to do that. Um, but we actually paid them out through the end of their contracts because these guys don't make a lot of money individually. Um, so we allowed them to all go home and we made that decision pretty decisively. I was actually on like my only vacation of the year in Jamaica at the time COVID was hitting. And I, my family was rather annoyed by me, but I, uh, but that's when we had to shut down the season. On the entertainment side, on the healthcare side, my day job is alloy, diverse, uh, is alloy therapeutics, where um, we make human monoclonal antibodies and services and startup companies. So th this actually in my, in my day job and the thing that is most important to me um, the world needs more antibodies. And like antibodies are the thing that you use to treat or the human body uses to fight off COVID. So ironically, this is like, we are, we're the simultaneously more busy uh, than ever. Um, I mean, I can come back to some alloy related things, but on the healthcare side, we also, I'm on the board of a company called Wellbe Health. That, that's important to me. It's actually co-founded by one of my classmates at Tuck, uh, Cy France. And this is, that I think is the most amazing COVID story I know and the most talented team and how they responded to the crisis. Because what, what Wellbe does is it actually takes care of end of life patients in this at home model where they come to a central facility. So your loved ones can age in place, but these are Medicare, Medicaid, nursing home eligible patients. So these are the poorest, most frail and elderly uh, in our population. And Cy created the company, the first for-profit company that is he's completely mission driven and I'm on the board. And so within 24, 48 hours, where all of the deaths are obviously the at-risk populations or people with comorbidities and who are elderly, and that's every one of our patients who are in the life at, at Wellby. And so what was phenomenal in that story was our chief operating officer, he's like an ex-Navy SEAL doc, and they operationalized this and they made it and they have had no infections and no deaths for any wow. of their patients. And that is the truly inspiration story for me. So I, I saw how really talented people were leaning in and, and sitting out from the board um, perspective and being able to use some of the things that I know how to do to, to just give some advice was, was really um, important perhaps in, in not only what I could do, but honestly what I was learning from Cy and their team and how I could apply that to our biotech company, which has you know, not an at-risk population in the office in the lab. 
And so then the biggest challenge is, I, th I think the biggest challenge personally then is, is a lot what Mike and Leo said, which is managing the personal dynamic of your employees and their families. And, you know, for us, we're very busy and I take what we do really, really seriously. I mean, we, we make medicine and part of our ethos at Alloy is collaborating with others to bring cures to patients faster. And so do you not move fast to cure disease in a, in a situation like this? Like that's against all of our ethos at Alloy. And so simultaneously, how do we lean in and control what we can control but at the same time being mindful of the safety of our patient, of, of our, of, of our employees. And so that was, that's tough. So I had to, we had to rework how, how the way that we're working. We're a global company as well, very small, not 1200 when we're like 30 people, but across five different sites and uh, we run a decentralized organization. And so that was tough. Um, and day to day, I'm still managing that day to day. We, I do a 30 minute check in three days a week where there is no business discussed. We are just chit chatting with the team as, as a way to try to bring the, the tension down a level level. And it gives me an insight into what's happening with my people, hopefully. Um, and boy, a hundred other ways we're trying to deal with it, but it's really come around to people and how do you motivate and manage folks in a world where we really want to be working hard to help any way we can. So thank you, Eric. It's, it's interesting, entertainment and health kind of to the industries that from the outside are the biggest drop and arguably in some ways the biggest surge in activity, but common theme across capital markets and technology with Leela about just this complex interplay between your business imperatives, but you've got employees and other people, stakeholders who are living through personal crises or just personal anxiety. So I, that, that theme I hear, we'll come back to it. I'm wondering a related question I'd like to ask you to, especially from the, I think about our students who are um, going to, who aspire to be like you all in the years ahead. Can you share a little bit about, for you as you personally, I guess we'll go in the same order, you Mike, you Leela, you Eric, what has been, what has been the biggest change or the most challenging thing for you to do, either just, you can answer that either in terms of wise, decisive leadership in a, in a business perspective, or if you're willing to share something about just in you as a human being, um, what has been the biggest change or the biggest challenge that you felt you faced? Well, for me, clearly uh, the working from home element of it, um, there are a whole bunch of things that we're going to end up doing that we've never done before. So one of the things that, that we do is, you know, we raise capital. We're trying to raise a, um, an investment vehicle where we can invest in companies that, that are, whose capital structures were not designed for this type of business interruption. So we're trying to raise upwards of $10 billion to be a part of the solution. It's been interesting because having, um, and you know, for, for Leela and Eric, I'm sure it's true as well, having a bit of a, a mission around what we're doing, trying to find a way to help. Obviously, Eric is doing it very directly um, through antibodies and other things. Um, you know, but people want to be able to to help and feel like they're contributing. And I think a lot of people find that a struggle. How, how can they personally help? Um, but the idea of raising a, a $10 billion vehicle of, of any sort without a single in-person meeting from start to finish is, 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 is you know, has never been done before. Um, and it's pretty remarkable. Um, but in the same way, as an example, just to make it a little more personal, um, email is not really an effective communication tool for me anymore. It, it doesn't it doesn't work and so you why know, why does it work slack and chat rooms it's too overwhelming because you can't for me you can't but if we if we had a, a tough decision to make we grab the three or four people in the office and we'd sit there and, and talk through it together um you don't know what other people are doing so you can't get a zoom room together as easily everything is scheduled and people need to get information out and there's just too much volume there's just it's it, it's absolutely enormous um, and so there are real stresses and strains for working from home. So I think there's strengths and there's weaknesses. And I'll give one more observation personally, which is um, Eric touched on this, as did Leela. Um, you know, EQ is more important than ever. So trying to figure out how is somebody doing um, by a conference call or by Zoom or WebEx or whatever it may be, and like really figuring out how they're doing. Um, and how hard someone's working because you don't really you don't know it's one thing if you're in an office environment and you hear that someone was there extraordinarily late and has been in all weekend you don't you don't really know so the EQ is extremely hard in what in some ways is a, a very impersonal environment of being on zoom um, at the same time and again this is the dichotomy um, I find that I have had a deeper more personal connection to clients that I've known for a decade. There's things that I did not know about them that I've learned. Um, same thing with, with 
colleagues. Um, you know, there's a shared experience that's going on uh, and the depth of those relationships um, are much stronger. So at the same time, there's disconnect, there's other areas where there's deeper connection. Um, and that's been, you know, that's been a big adjustment. So to Lila's point earlier, how do you lead in that type of, or Eric, how do you lead in that type of environment? It requires, it's a different skill set. Um, and again, I think that it's that EQ personalized element of it, which I, I think is absolutely at a, a premium at this point. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just pick up on that. It's, well, first of all, it was exhausting, I'll say. Um, <laughs> I, especially that first, that first month to six weeks, I was just so drained, I think, from what it required from a leadership standpoint. One actual tool that I used uh, exactly on that point, Mike, around the EQ, was there's, you can Google this, um, there's, a, a four, there's a four quadrant mood meter which I think Yale or some, some other organization put out um, that I used to, that I would put up on this Zoom screen at the start of every team leads meeting and ask people to, to place themselves on that quadrant in terms of how they were feeling. Because I think what we were all conscious of, especially in those early days, was that people, uh, and the most stable of people, would be bouncing between the quadrants in the space of a few hours, uh, just in terms of whether they were feeling frustrated or helpless or um, energized or whatever it was. So I found that to be just a really good forcing function for um, having people open up about how they were honestly feeling in that moment. Uh, and then, of course, you know, it's like any situational leadership thing. You, 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 you flex your style to, to suit the moment. Um, but yes, I have found empathy and focus on how people are feeling has been just front and center um, as, a, as a leader. A couple of other thoughts. Um, I, you know, I, you, you talk about wise, decisive leadership. For my team in the trenches was this influx of, you know, we, we did all of our planning for 2020 back in Q4 into, you know, and we're tweaking it in early Q1. And then none of us saw this coming. And it just meant a raft of other opportunities and needs suddenly arising. And for any member of my team in the trenches, I think, you know, they were looking around at just this forest of things that they felt like they needed to, to work on in addition to being safe and taking care of their families and, and looking after their, their health. And so um, I found one of the most important things to do was to actually sit down proactively with leaders and w look at their list and help them stack rank and take things off their plate and tell them it was okay to drop something that formerly, formerly seemed really, really important because it just wasn't that important anymore or because some new need had arisen that, that superseded that. And that I think was important for them, especially with a team that's very driven and prides itself on delivering. It can be hard for them to take things off the plate when they, they can sense that they're important, but I think we just all had to, to reset expectations and help the team um, make that adjustment. And then I think the third thing was uh, just trying to be even more proactive than usual and thinking about how to inspire the team and have them feel like what they were doing mattered. Um, so a couple of couple of threads on that front. I kicked off a uh, what we call marketing wins of the week video that I post in our marketing Slack channel to just give shout outs to people around the organization that are doing incredible work that often just goes unseen and at a time like this was definitely going unseen. So it's a little hokey. Now I've started having my other leaders on my team record it because nobody wants to hear me every week, but I find that's been a way to to lift the spirits. And then more broadly speaking, uh, really leaning into customer stories and understanding again how the work that we are doing is changing. It's flattening curves in states like you know, Rhode Island where we're, we're partnering with the Department of Health to help them on contact tracing. It's helping organizations take care of their customers or whatever it happens to be. I mean, th there's, there's work being done that is really making a difference right now. And I think we have leaned even more heavily than we typically do into surfacing and celebrating those customer stories so the team can feel really inspired and proud. That's awesome. That's great, Lila. Eric, you personally? Yeah, me personally. Um, first, I would say it's a reinforcement of something that I didn't know while I was at Tuck, but I continue to, to, to rediscover in the 13 plus years since then, which is organizational behavior. It was a lot more important than I took it while I was there. But also from where we sit, you know, in an advisory group, we're kind of thinking about the theory of tuck. I just certainly I, I appreciated how much how thoughtful the curriculum is and forcing me to take those things that I think when I was younger, I, I didn't appreciate how important it was. And you've got that whole toolbox as a leader that, you know, at times like this it becomes very important. So for me, this feels a lot more like 9-11 than it is like 08, 09 financial collapse where we were leading, or the, you know, at various organizations. When 9-11, we lost our building. I was at Lehman Brothers at the time when I was on and it was like, student council for the investment bank. It's like a, 
it was it, it was it was a joke. So until you lose your until you lose your organization, and by you know within a week we wanted to be fully operational uh, in a hotel in Midtown Manhattan, and uh, I stepped up and agreed to organize all of our analysts and most of our associates to actually try to figure out how do you get a functional investment bank going in a week. And this feels more like 9/11 to me because everything was so abrupt, and it was like oh my gosh. But then the, the piece where it doesn't feel like 9-11 is the whole world didn't need a bailout in 9-11. Like things actually came back to normal within weeks, like travel picked back up. And what we're still living through today, and we don't know how it's going to play out, is like th this is every single industry simultaneously. These incredible demand shocks now that it's just, it's just waiting to come. I'd love to hear from Mike actually what's going to happen. Um, we see this across our businesses, not just in, in what I do day-to-day -day in biotech. And so I worry about that. And so then for me, it's about... Um, how do you balance between the, the, the fear versus the data? And so that's a lot of the things that we focus on uh, at Alloy. I mean, as a scientist, that is, um, we're prepared to do that as, as an econometrist and an economist by background. That's what I studied when I was at Dartmouth. Um, my advisor was, was one of the gentlemen on this call here today. Thank you, Professor Slaughter. Um, you know, prepared to analyze data and separate that from emotion, which in times of crisis, you know, you as a leader, that's what you really need to understand how to do. And then how do you lead people uh, with data, but not, um, but not getting lost in the fact that this is, these are all human decisions. So I think that was the, that, that's probably for me as someone who's more perhaps logical and data driven, um, this moment and being forced on, on Zoom, and as you say, Mike, I think it was a really good point of how do you get a sense for what people are feeling? Like it's, because it's just really hard um, and you lose a lot of the nonverbal if you're just by phone. So Zoom helps, but even that you lose other ways. And so if you haven't invested in your people and your culture up until this point, I think you were in trouble when something like this hits. So we have a saying at Ulysses and at Alloy, when is the best time to plant a tree? It's an old Zen Cohen. And the answer is today or 20 years ago. And like, that's a really good reminder for this of the things that we invest in such that, you know, no one predicted coronavirus, but things like coronavirus happen. I mean, we lived through 9-11, lived through 08, 09, and, and now coronavirus and some other crises, and you're gonna have personal ones. And so you should do the hard work to invest in your relationships before then, because when your team is stressed and you are stressed, you will lean on that investment. That's, I'm reminded of that and the importance of that because of this incident. Uh, no, that's great. I appreciate that. I can connect it back to learnings at Tuck too. So uh, maybe one more question and we'll open it up to the uh, chat and the Q&A. And, and uh, Samyak, thank you. I see you already asked one question, so we'll come to that. But it, the last question I'll ask, it kind of is on your point, Eric, about wanting Mike to tell us this crystal ball of the future. Uh, Answer this any way you want, but let's. If, if I asked each of you, if we look to a, a safer post coronavirus world, now the virus could be with us in perpetuity, but I mean the immediacy of this crisis. So give me some world where, in some number of months down the road, there's more effective palliative treatments, there's, there's something more akin to a vaccine. What in that, either in your organization or the broader world, are, is there something you're hopeful for? Maybe, and if it's not hopeful, then it can be a little bit more of a balanced answer. But Mike, if you look up at Goldman or at capital markets at the end of 2021 or end of 2020, or as we move into 2021, is there something you're like, oh, this is some good that's going to come from this tragedy? So just wondering kind of as, as you look to the future for your organization or the world, is there something that you're seeing discerning this is going to be better? And what might that be for your organization culturally or business-wise in the world? Maybe we'll go to each of you and then we'll open it up. So I can a good initial question. So if you guys got you questions, by the post into the Q&A. Sure. So our, um, you know, our former CEO, uh, Lloyd Blankfein, um, used to say, and, and he was leading the firm through the global financial crisis, um, and every time there was uh, some sort of disruption, um, he would say that, um, you know, every crisis, when you're in the middle of a crisis, that's always the worst crisis, because you don't know how it's going to resolve itself, and they always get resolved. Um, I do tend to think that when you're in the teeth of a crisis, I think there, there tends to be an over-exaggeration for how things will, will change. Um, and sure, there'll be things like telemedicine that'll be different. And um, I think there will be a lot more commuting from home. And so does everyone need to be working in lower Manhattan or downtown San Francisco? Um, so there'll, there'll clearly be elements and changes. Uh, and I think that's mostly trends that were already in place that will be accentuated. But then there's some new things again that um, I think people are realizing how effective you can be out of the office and telemedicine is another good e example, uh, et cetera. But I, I actually think that 
the, the biggest thing, if we, if we look back at, at 9-11 or if we look back at the global financial crisis, um, the things that were truly lasting were, were, were more about um, um, the social contract, maybe, if I call it that, in, in different ways. Um, so the response of the United States after 9-11, what was done um, in people's, oh, no one's going to fly again. Right. And September 18th, no one's going to fly for, you know, for years and sure TSA is different and you go through lines and it's longer and you, you, it's an adapt, it's an adaptation. So yes, there'll be things like that that will be adapted. Um, but a lot of other major things really change the role of, of the United States in the world, the outlook towards things, the Patriot Act, there are, there are bigger things. If I look at some of the, the more geopolitical things that changed after the global financial crisis, I mean, these are major I mean, historians were, it's a major inflection point um, in the macro. I don't mean macro economics, I mean global geopolitical, very sweeping changes. And here's where I think that what's likely to change the most um, coming out of um, a health pandemic, and this is where I'm optimistic, is I hope, I hope that everyone going, as Eric said, everyone going through it simultaneously around the world um, something that everyone could be fearful of uh, together, going through together, although there's different responses of all types. One thing that I'm hopeful of is that there's more attention and understanding paid to, to vulnerable populations in the world. And that's, that's a big, broad group. That's people who are struggling with addiction. It's people who are, um, you know, have a lot of, there, there are a lot of really hard things out there. And I think many of the um, leaders in the world, whether those are, those are policymakers, business leaders, um, entertainment leaders, what have you, they, they haven't had to deal or face or really confront a lot of that. And I'm hopeful that given that this has touched everybody and you, you know, the collections that get raised for the shoeshine guy that comes on our floor or um, the outpouring um, in places that I've seen of, of support that has gone so far beyond what is normal. I hope that the awareness of how many people who are vulnerable in this world, um, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, I, I am hopeful that this has opened people's eyes um, and that there'll be um, um, you know, maybe a fairer balance of, of, of how people are are treated with care around the world. That's my that's my hopeful, optimistic view. I like. I could bore you with what Goldman's doing too, or if everyone's here at Capital Markets Summary in a little bit. I'm happy to do that. But <laughs> yeah, we'll, but to we'll me, that's, that's, no, the, no, that's the bigger piece. We need it. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so, I guess continuing that thread, I'm hopeful that the raised consciousness around the importance of mental health is something that destigmatizes something that is quite pervasive in society. So I, I think there's not a human out there that hasn't been somehow impacted by this. And certainly within SurveyMonkey, but and at pure companies that I've talked to, there's just been a whole lot more focus on, on people's, uh, how people are doing through this. And so I hope that's something that, uh, again, just leads to a lot more um, helpful conversation around, around that in particular. If I think about the shifts. So on the one hand, I agree with Mike, it's probably not as um, drastic as we, we sort of think right now. But on the other hand, you know, while no one would have wished this crisis on, on the world by any means, um, there's a certain efficiency that comes with more work from home and certain practices. And I, I, I don't think we are going back to, to business as usual anytime soon. Um, we at SurveyMonkey, along with many other organizations out there, are in the process of rethinking, reimagining the workplace. Like, what is that what does it look like? How do we, first of all, how do we come back online in a way that people are comfortable with? We're serving our employees right now to figure out what are the things we need to do in the office to, to help them feel comfortable about coming back in, um, including things like staggering shifts or having people in the office on different days. But I, I think it will bring changes um, in the long term because uh, I, I think we've, we've seen a different way of working that can be productive and effective and we're not all going to virtual all the time anytime soon but I, I do think there will be there will be changes there and then from a marketing standpoint you know every company out there I think has has pivoted heavily into thinking about how they deliver value at times and so we're seeing a lot more value-based marketing propositions and messages and 
frankly, a focus uh, is one, one uh, pure put it from selling to helping. And I hope that continues. I think, I think that's really where the best marketing happens. Um, but from a channel standpoint, we're going to have to rethink how we do things. I don't know if the global tens of thousands person conference is coming back. I just don't know how soon. I, I mean, the big tech companies have all gone out and said they're not doing anything till at least the middle of next year. But I can tell you as a marketing leader, my appetite to bring together thousands of people is pretty reduced, uh, you know, going forward, because I just, it, it's hard to know exactly how this, how this will play out in the coming quarters. Will we see, you know, waves of this continue? When are people going to feel comfortable traveling and congregating in large groups? So I think there's still a lot that we don't know yet, but I can, uh, I can tell you that from a marketing standpoint, we are, uh, you know, really thinking about how do we reinvent marketing for, for these times. And then last, you know, that the, the human empathy piece that we've talked about throughout this, I mean, yeah. I, my, I really, really hope that that remains uh, at the foreground of uh, the way we lead. That's awesome. Thanks, Leah. That's a great range of things. Eric, any kind of quick thoughts on this and we'll go to the uh, questions from the students then? Yeah, what, what good from the tragedy perhaps. So first of all, I would say that this is all in the context of a little data. So the mortality of COVID is a lot lower than what we feared it would be when we lacked data at the front end of this. So especially now as we find there's a lot of asymptomatic carriers, which is actually makes, makes it very difficult to contain. But the silver lining of that is a lot of people have had COVID and they never even demonstrated symptoms. So that's really good. So our overall mortality is looking closer to flu than it is something astronomically worse. So, so my, my feeling of optimism is grounded in the fact that like it is a tragedy every time someone is dying of something that uh, you know six months ago wasn't even a thing. But at the same time, it's like it's so much less than our fears. So. Um, I think the most important thing is the shared experience, that this is, this is truly our first global, real-time shared experience with an enemy that is not us versus them. And if you, if you just kind of think yeah. about that, how that, it, 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 is, it is a universal experience where everyone is forced to consider what's important in their life and like, why do they get out of bed in the morning? And, and this is, I think that's going to be the most important thing that when you meet someone from China six years from now, you might think, oh yeah, what were you doing? during COVID, like, I don't know. And so this is the first time we have that as a world. And I don't think that's to be underestimated how there's a potential there to bring us together globally in a way that is meaningful. Yeah, thank you. And I think one, one difference that the last pandemic of, of about a hundred years ago, we didn't have the imminence of technology. People experienced it, but that just what, we didn't have Survey Monkey. we didn't have the connectivity to kind of have people voice and, and kind of think about that. So I like that optimism. Uh, a handful of questions in the Q&A, so keep adding them if you'd like. Um, Samia kicked us off uh, asking, um, and I should have said this, sorry. Uh, insights on what the MBA Council is currently working on and their new initiative ideas. I should have said at the outset, uh, the MBA Advisory Council, like the Board of Advisors, we meet twice a year. Um, we, deans and other leaders that talk, kind of there's a synchronicity to what we do, where we have them focus, especially this council, on the bread and butter of the MBA program of admissions, uh, of how we're doing in the learning environment, how we're doing with career placement. Um, but uh, a big thing that the council members do is help us look outwards. So for example, the last in-person meetings uh, that we had in November, we met in the Bay Area near Lila, and um, we had field trips. Half of the council went to, um, I think there's a business school there called Haas. Half of them went to a business school, I think it's called Stanford GSB. And we wanted them to see and help us co-create the strategic intent that we're talking about, talking to the investment initiatives that we see for building on the future by having that kind of market data. Uh, they're always helping us think about admissions. They're always helping us think about um, placement. Some of you have uh, conversations with them when you're coming into talk like they do with prospective students. Um, and of late, right now, they've been central in helping us create what we announced yesterday in the community of the Tuck Summer Fellows Program to think about for first years that might not have a traditional internship. And thank you, Eric, in advance, who's one of the ones who's already, I think we have a project related to the rugby that you mentioned. But sorry, Leela, Mike, Eric, anything else you want to say about the work of the council before we go to some of the other questions? I'd ask Mike to chip in on that as the veteran. Mike's been on the yeah, council so, six or six years, I believe. <laughs> yeah. So I guess um, you know one of the things that I, I hope. Well, firstly, it's an advisory board, <clears throat> and I think that's an important thing for every for 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 those who the students who may not be as familiar. So it's different than being a, a trustee of the college where you have a governance role and you're, um, you're you have different responsibilities. Um, both the board of advisors as well as the MBA council. Um, our responsibility is to is to give Matt and the, the senior staff our best advice and counsel 
Um, and so um, it's a wonderful collection of people from around the world. And you know, you, you see it, you know, here you've got, you know, biotech, entertainment, technology, and finance, um, three different corners of the United States. Um, th it brings a lot of great, um, great minds around the table. Um, and I think, I hope, I hope Matt would agree that the, the advice that comes out of a group like that, when you get a group like that together, good things are going to happen. Um, I think Matt gave a kind introduction of, uh, I think, three characteristics um, of, you know, Leela, Eric, and I. Uh, the one that I resonate personally with the most is when you said we're all dedicated members of, of the, the Tuck alumni. The people on these boards are massively dedicated to Tuck. They love Tuck. Um, and so hopefully Matt gets uh, good advice and guidance out of it. And totally. what the members get, the board members get, um, you get to come back to Tuck, you get to reconnect with students, you get to do things like this web, you know, webinar, um, and um, you get to know each other. And so it's a, it's a great win-win all around. I'd say one of the, the bigger changes is actually the leadership, the structure of the council and how it works. And so, so you know, I, I'm, I'm the old, old timer, so I hang out for a year, but at least I can then share with Eric, who's the incoming chair, uh, some of my experiences. Leela as the vice chair is a part of it. Um, that so then when Eric moves on, Leela steps right in, and this 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 learning, this constant learning, you know, I think is actually a very good thing because as I, when Eric, Leela, and I met before you, well, you let us loose. The three of us started talking a, a few months ago about this, and I shared with them a couple of regrets that I had and wish things that I wish I would have done because it took me it took a little while for me to figure out um, how to be most effective, and so maybe I'll stop right. there. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yes, their council is um, wide ranging and vigorous and we love it because we constantly need to be looking outward and understanding where Tuck's strategic position is and how we envision making us stronger tomorrow. And it's alums like Leela and Mike and Eric who um, are so generous with the time and in other ways to help us envision that and bring it to life with us. So it's great. A um, Couple of questions then as I look at the Q and A, uh, I'm gonna link together Tony, Kim, thank you and Vishal Agarwal is a question for all of you about um, Thanking you for identifying, being centered to the mood of your employees and the, the, that sense of emotional intelligence, the EQ. And the question was, how do you take that into um, hopefully positive and inspiring action? Especially, I think there was a sub question for you, Mike, from Vishal, managing anxiety that might be there, not just of employees, but of clients uh, or of other stakeholders in your local community. So a broad question to all of you, um, you're harnessing this information, it's pretty varied and how are you trying to translate, I think, into optimistic, um, inspiring work? If you don't mind, I'll go first. It's a uh, so credit to Cy France, as I mentioned, CEO of Wellbe and the, the co-founder of Wellbe. Um, this is something we employ, but he said it most clearly uh, to me, which is we are optimists. As entrepreneurs, we're optimists by disposition. And so we're always like, hey, like, it's going to be great. Like, it's going to be totally fine. This will pass. And that's my disposition. And then the opposite extreme is sort of the pessimist that like you get inside your head and you're like, oh my God, like what is going to happen? I can't imagine what is, and like, th those are the wrong approaches in a crisis. It's like sort of recognizing logically the wrong thing. So what's in the middle? So what's the pragmatic approach to a crisis? Um, and I think that's the way to communicate with investors and, and to your team of sort of being uh, aware of that balance between optimism and pessimism, and then the way to focus yourself in, and this was size advice that I repeat then to, to this group, which is to say, what are the things you can control today? And you've got your list, and they put three things on a list at Wellbe and like, bam, bang, bang. And so in a crisis, you're like, you can focus on the proximate and, uh, and not, you know, do crazy things that are maybe overly optimistic that is not, you know, which is my disposition as it, or, or things that are overly pessimistic. And so that was a really good piece of advice in a way that I, I think about managing the expectations of not only my employees, but certainly my investors and, and the partners we work with as well, just as yeah. one example. That's a great example. Thank you. And I'm, I'm writing notes and lists from what you guys are saying, but I hear you, the optimism, but in the practical lists. Leela, Mike, any other thoughts on this opening question? Yeah, I, I think uh, on our side, I found that uh, our employees find transparency incredibly. Yeah. Done a couple of things we've we had we formerly had a, a bi-weekly troop town hall is what we call our, our regular all hands so we upped the frequency of that to once a week um we uh hopefully you can still hear me i'm told my internet connection is unstable so yeah, you're good you, you came me? back yep you're okay, good. good yeah so we've upped it up the frequency of our weekly of our troop town halls to to weekly 
Um, we've launched a video series. Again, my, my CEO will just share once a week what's going on in his life. We're just having a lot more transparent conversations across our employee base to help them understand that feeling unsettled or uncertain or frustrated or anxious is normal. So that's been one thing. With our communities, I would say, just as we've seen the demise of uh, in-person meetings, we've seen the rise of virtual meetings. So we've been hosting sessions with customers and with peer groups to just trade ideas. Um, and I think forge bonds in different ways. So uh, again, sort of in, in embracing transparency and finding a lot of power in sharing common, um, common experiences and learning from one another. That's been quite, quite powerful. That's great. Thanks, Elizabeth. So, so I, I, you know, I'd share my observations with, you know, that there's a common strain through, through all of these. I'll, I'll give three sort of quick examples of, of, you know, I think some of it's trial and error. So three things that, that um, uh, we've tried a bunch uh, but I'll give you three that, that I think have worked very well. One is that um, I think as most of you know, and you can, it's, it can be lonely as a leader, you know, when you're going through something yourself, you're making the final decisions and all that. So it's, it's lonely. Uh, to have a peer group, I think is, is very helpful. So, you know, at, uh, at Goldman, one thing that we did is that we created pods of about, you know, people opted in. So it's people who wanted it, um, but four or five people, generally very senior people for but different parts of the firm, just talking through, um, you know, what, what's working, what's not working, um, fears, pressures, you know, but to create a, a trusted circle of, of folks that you could actually um, get some good advice from. So that's sort of on, on one end of the spectrum. The other one was something that uh, one of my colleagues suggested to me was, um, you know, there's a lot of more junior folks, um, maybe they're out of undergrad or, um, you know, or, or just out of business school. Uh, that I don't interact with on a daily basis, you know, in the ordinary times. And then since work from home, I've had even less exposure to them. Um, and they suggested a, a Zoom cocktail hour where no one, no one VP or more senior was there. Um, and it was, we just talked. It was actually invigorating for me. Um, and I got to really hear what, what, what they were working with and not, not like work projects, but like what they're dealing with at home and, you know, one, one, one of the kids, he's 23, drove home to Ohio and he's there with his parents and five brothers and they decided to take on some guide dogs that couldn't be taken because of other things. And it just, it, it totally changed the rapport uh, with all of them. I took a lot out of it uh, as well. So uh, there's, I think there's fun experiments of, of things like that, that that wouldn't happen other than in this environment. And then the other thing that we tried to do, and we can do it because we're a bigger company, um, is uh, giving people volunteer opportunities, things that they can do virtually. So we have a program uh, at work we call Community Teamwork, so where people dedicate a day to volunteer or do a variety of things. So these are organized events that you sign up for. Um, and so we're, we that's all been twisted to, um, you know, virtual volunteering, and it's everything from helping helping tutor kids who are having trouble with online learning. You know, there's a whole variety of things that you can get involved with. And again, I think that goes in the vein of people feeling like they want to be able to help and they don't know how to help. Um, so we've tried to yeah. make that easy and efficient for people. Hmm. That was a great range of tangible examples. So thanks all of you on that. Uh, that was a good opening couple of questions after Samyak's on the process. Uh, so we got five questions to see, which are great, kind of across different things. So we'll, we'll try to um, move through them with purpose, given that we could probably keep talking for a couple of hours, but you guys are gracious. Now, we only have 10 more minutes of your time. A very practical one for especially second year students. Um, what, um, as you look to, given so many industries are affected, any advice you would have as an anonymous question for those who will be recruiting for full-time roles in the fall? And given that, you know, economically, we might still be in a recession before some of the build back comes. So any practical advice about recruiting next fall? And, and not everybody has to take these uh, questions, but any thoughts on this one? Leo? I guess, yeah, I mean, the, rea the unfortunate reality is you are seeing companies um, roll out hiring freezes and do certain things um, out of necessity, I think, at this time. So uh, I guess if it was me, I would just be really targeted in thinking through the types of organization and opportunity where I could add value. Um, you know, there are, there are companies, there are organizations, there are sectors that are um, seeing the opposite. You know, they're seeing a, seeing a surge in opportunity and demand. So uh, again, I would just probably reflect on how you can add value um, as, a, as a professional and look at, find the intersection of that with where there is opportunity in the economy right now 
And uh, the other thing is, you know, we're right in the, the heart of earnings season right now. So organizations are disclosing how, you know, what their current attitude or, or stance is toward hiring. So you can have that information um, as another uh, kind of input as you're evaluating where to focus. You, you do not have to be objectively the best person. This is the old joke of the hunters running away from the bear, right? So you are competing for what will still be a very robust economy and for the roles in there. And so to echo what Leela said, the biggest mistake that I see people making, who I talk to Tuckies um, or otherwise, is that they view their, their job through the lens of what am I going to get out of it? And so the, the most important advice I could give you is just really try to understand how you can be useful to somebody else. And if you approach every conversation and every meeting with a visiting executive or whatnot and being like, how can I be useful here? And at some point you're gonna find the right matchup for where you're useful and where they think you're useful. But if you take it as like, is this the best experience? Like, is this gonna be that? What am I gonna get out of this? Like, it's gonna be really hard for you to get a job in a recession. But there's always, always, always a demand for someone who approaches one of our companies and says, I thought about it. Like, this is how I can be useful. Is that true? And I say, actually, A, B, and C are useful, but D and F are not. And it's like, oh my gosh, then don't do those. I wanna do this instead. I'm like, oh my God, you're hired tomorrow. And so have flexibility, understand that you're going to have to be creative. And the more you lean in and don't rely on other people pushing to you and you can be creative and, and be willing to solve the problem, that'd be awesome. Gather Just information, that. think about the organizations to connect Lila and Eric. Thank you. Those are great. Mike, anything you'd add quickly to this? I, I'd, I'd say be creative. Uh, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a very tough job environment. And it's going to be because of you know, what's going on. Um, and, um, but it, again, a theme that we've been talking about here is people want to help, um, that, and that's helping in all different ways. And that includes senior people at organizations where maybe they can't um, ha hire right now because they don't have a full-time job, but you may be, be able to do something project-based in an area, industry, subject, topic, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. Um, there is a, um, it, you know, um, an open-mindedness, there's a, there's a uh, there's an opportunity here to, to really, as Eric said, if you approach it the right way, people can create, you know, a virtual internship or something like that, that, um, that I'd encourage you to, to do it in a targeted way and be a bit creative about, you know, taking, taking your, own, your own destiny into your own hands. Listen to Stephen Pigeon and what he recommends you do. <laughs> He's actually got a pretty, you know, the plan will evolve, but just listen to what he says about being proactive and acting early as well. Lean in. Yeah, he, he, he's a professional at it. The rest of us, were just, we, just play, we just play, you know, placement folks on, on Zooms. Love it. That's great. I'm going to, uh, Joe Glado asked a question. It's kind of the converse of this from the organization perspective about people. So thank you for this, Joe. Any quick thoughts on, as leaders, how do you think about the trade-offs, given the financial reality and the pressures of the, of the, of the emerging recession, of uh, reducing short-term costs by layoffs or redundancies of different kinds of colleagues versus trying to keep key people on and absorbing those financial costs some other way to maintain the goodwill and have that human capital for when the, when the uh, growth rebounds? Any thoughts on that? I know it's a hard may, question may, to navigate. No, may, Man, maybe I'll take that one because we, we, we have to deal with that every day with the, especially we, we control a couple dozen companies <clears throat> and when you're, you're the control shareholder, you, you have to make those choices. Um, I've never in my whatever 25 year professional career, I've never seen um, as much discussion around um, uh, getting away from the hard line financial. This is the reality. This is, what capitalism is <clears throat> hard nosed. Um, I've never seen such taking into account so much about what's the right thing to do. Um, and I think uh, right thing for, for all the different constituents, um, um, vendors, you know, the ability to pay the willingness versus the ability to pay for things like rent. Um, the narrative in Washington that's going on right now um, is extraordinary. I mean, that's when I talk about social contract. I mean, people yeah. who should not have been taking this money who have um, and other things. Um, uh, the considerations that are being taken into account for what is right for people. Um, again, customers, it, it's, it's staff, it's, it's broadly defined. I've never seen anything quite, quite like it. Um, and the hope is that, like Eric said, maybe it is a little bit more like 9-11, where it does come back, you know, once, you know, as Lila said, once people need to feel safe. Right. 
if there's a vaccine or there's a cure or something that truly makes you feel safe, people will go back to a lot of the behaviors before. It's a question of how long that takes. Um, and so, um, you know, I think people are trying to be uh, humane and thoughtful and supportive in ways where they can. Unfortunately, there are just a lot of places where there isn't, the finances don't allow for it. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you're Airbnb, I think they just laid off a quarter of their, their staff right. yesterday today. I mean, they, their, their revenue is half this year. They don't, you know, in some situations, there, there really isn't a choice, I would say. In others, though, I will say, uh, you know, we all know it's a, tr it's a truism that companies that can invest in a downturn will, typically will gain share. And so, uh, you know, we're at SurveyMonkey, we're incredibly fortunate. I think we, we do have a re resilient business model and we're in demand right now. Um, even we are not making layoffs at this time, but we are, um, we looked at our base of uh, roles that we're hiring for and we selected half of them as being critical and are moving forward with those. So I think, you know, making focused investment um, so that we not only ride out the storm, but emerge stronger, that's, that's the, the path that we've been taking. I would, I mean, as a, as a CEO and as an investor, and you control these decisions, I think you're right, Mike, when you're the controlling shareholder, ultimately, actually, you're the one holding the checkbook. And so the decision is outside of your control. And so that's the advice I would give to a CEO or a leader is just to the mental health point you make, Leela, it, times like this are really hard in recession. No one likes firing anyone. And so you have to separate mentally the choice that you are making as a leader that's informed by your strategy versus the choice the world is making for you by shutting down in a global pandemic. And those are, those are very different things. And so you just psychologically, you got to separate those things. And so you try to look at them with like a cold hearted calculating, you know, view when it comes to what can we do? And you can't run your, run your company into bankruptcy. And so if you're an employee of a company and you're looking at how is your leadership or how are your investors making decisions, just recognize that's the, that's what they're trying to do there. And I think universally of all the, the investors I've been able to work with and have, have the privilege of working with and the team members, nobody wants to lay off people. It's like the hardest thing in the world. And so just, you know, you got to separate these decisions. We try to keep everyone. We're trying to lean in. No one wants to be making money though in this crisis. I think that's what's going to be really interesting during earnings season. I think there's a lot of CFOs that are going to be trying to hide profitability by doing stuff because how do you, how do you tap into your way to a funeral? And so, and our business is one of those businesses where demand is very high. We make human monoclonal antibodies. And, and so one of the things we did was offer free access to, to our, to our antibody discovery platform to anyone using it for COVID or otherwise. Got and it. It's, so, yeah, no, thank you. Eric. I'm just going to use chair prerogative. We got about one to two minutes. So we're going to do lightning round at the end, but close on one for the students. Anna asked a good question, Anna Fishbone. Uh, what types of opportunities, collaboration across industries do you see in the future? An optimistic one to, in five seconds you can pass. Anybody, something like, oh, this is an optimistic business opportunity. Good, that'll be a homework exercise for the next board chat. That's good, I like that. Uh, I don't know, government and, tech, government and technology is like coming a long way in a short time. Yeah. Education, okay, I mean, it's education at the elementary school level. We all, all those of us who are parents are seeing it like, oh my gosh, like why doesn't yeah. everyone a charter school is what I'm wondering, so. Yeah, great, okay, those are two. Mike, you want anything? Kester? I'm good, I'll leave it right. there. Uh, and a, a comment maybe I'll turn Connor's good question into, which is as business leaders, how do you balance the legitimate concerns and needs of people to get back to work, especially some of the most disadvantaged, as you pointed out, Mike, and most fragile, with the need to try to maintain our public health obligations through our private actions of maintaining distancing and so on. I, that's a, I, we could have a lot of conversation about that. It was a good question reflection from Connor about how do you balance that in your organizations? Any very quick reactions on that? Yeah, it comes down to data and trust, right? And those are different things. The data and like the, the legitimate recognition of people's fears are real and that's okay. That it comes down to mental health and otherwise. And you have to respect that as a form of data as a leader. But I would say, look, if you're between the age of 15 and 24, you have a higher chance of dying of the flu right now than you do of COVID. And that's, that's data, go to the CDC's website. And so whatever level of fear you had of dying of the flu up to a certain age on January 1st, that's still, you should be worried about that more than COVID. At every single age group from zero all the way up to 99, you have a higher chance of dying of pneumonia this year than COVID. That's a fact. So whatever your fear level of dying of pneumonia at the beginning of this year should be a, a, an appropriate level of fear, perhaps. COVID. Yeah, I hear. So, bad, so one answer kind of is, is bringing the information to bear that's relevant based on the public health. And the last question, uh, Michael asked a question about um, 
but I'll generalize a little bit. The question was, any advice you have, mental shortcuts, tools for shifting your mindsets? I mean, you guys have been so generous with your hour here. Goodness knows what you're doing the hour before, what you're gonna be doing in two minutes. Any advice on how to shift your mind with this fractious, uh, Mike used the metaphor, chaotic world, the, the phases you talked about, Leela, and more generally, I'll just say, any advice you would give to the students in particular this historic time? You guys were students once, the T20s and 21s are living through a historic time, so any mental or more general counsel you give, everybody gets a shot. Yeah, so I, I failed miserably because I'm now two minutes late for my team meeting, but uh, I've been trying to create <laughs> calendar buffers, like literally five to 10 minutes oh, yeah, between yeah. meetings, right? That's my- Totally yeah. Great, Don't calendar do buffers, do. yeah, yeah, thank you. Anything else, Eric, Mike? I, I'd say um, pick a few routines and, and stick with them. So for example, one thing, I, I get up very early in the morning, I walk my dog and I walk and there's no one around. I live in a suburb of New York, so I can do that. And but I do, I do work calls and, you know, but sticking to it, you know, I, I shower and shave every day, right? I mean, I do, there's a whole lot of things you can let slide. Find the routines that, that help you find um, stability um, and they, that help ground you and can help, help you unwind. And so just, just pick a few and, and, and really try to stick with them would be my advice. Con control the controllables, like good sports metaphor there. Nice one. And look, I would say is don't overthink it. <laughs> An anxiety is an inward facing thing. So you can live inside your own head. And so my trick is to just say, fuck it. Like th this is the next thing I'm doing. And you act as if, and you are action oriented in a crisis and you get things done and you build on that momentum. So don't overthink it. Like there's times to reflect and there's times to act. So if you're going to your next meeting, just go into your next meeting and do it. And then later we're worry about whether you did a good job. Thank you. Uh, Lila, run off to your next meeting. I thank you so much, you guys, for launching this new initiative at Tuck the Tuck Board Chats. Uh, Lila, Mike, Eric, thank you so much. And everyone in the community, stay safe today. Good luck with classes this afternoon and anything else co-curricular. Um, and the next one of these, I think, is next week. We have two more scheduled. Um, uh, one, uh, it's going to focus on sports uh, with um, Russell Wolf and... Um, uh, uh, LA Rams COO, I was name I'm blanking out. Kevin Demoff. Thank you, Kevin Demoff. And we'll do one on Global Capital Arts with the colleague of Mike's, uh, Jim Esposito. So thank you both. Stay safe, everybody, and have a good rest of the afternoon, okay? We'll see everybody soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Be well. Bye. Be safe.